Hey guys, this is Dodoid. So, I don't usually start videos outside, but today I have a reason. The building behind me is 875 Carling Avenue, and while today it's home to the Canadian Meat Council, in 1999, suite 210 of that building was the Ottawa Sales Office of Silicon Graphics Computer Systems. Now, I don't know much about the office. I don't know what products were kept in stock, if any at all, how big the staff was, or what the room even looked like. But it is still cool to be within walking distance of something that was at some point related to Silicon Graphics. In 1982, Silicon Graphics was founded by James H. Clark of Stanford University, along with seven graduate students and research staff. A year later, they released their first product, the Iris 1000 Graphics Terminal. It was a Motorola 68000-based graphics terminal, which connected to a normal mainframe such as a DEC VAX and provided graphics capabilities. While the device had separate CPUs, could sometimes use hard drives, and even ran SGI's GL2 operating system, they were not full computers, and still had to connect to a mainframe for most of their processing. Just three years later, in 1985, SGI released the Iris 2000, which developed their earlier terminals into independent Unix workstations. Earlier 2000 series systems used 68010 processors, while later turbo models used 68020s. The 3000 series was similar, but featured SGI's new geometry engine, marking the first time 3D graphics acceleration had been widely available. SGI's Motorola-based systems culminated in the Iris 3130, which was powerful enough not only to be used separately from a mainframe when working on scenes, but to render completed animations directly on the workstation. In March 1987, SGI released the Professional Iris 4D60 with an 8MHz MIPS R2000 CPU. This was the first SGI to use a MIPS processor, and it was far from the last. It had a base price of $74,000 and placed its power supply and storage devices in a separate box connected only by the base. Now is a good time to mention that to go with their new MIPS hardware, SGI released a new Unix operating system known as 4D1. Version 4D1 4.0 was the first version to be referred to as IRIX, and the next major version was known simply as IRIX 5. Back to hardware. Just over a year after the Professional Iris launched, in October of 1988, SGI replaced it with the Personal Iris Workstation and the Power Series Visualization System. While earlier systems had been available in a wide range of configurations of varying performance, this was the first time a clear division between desktop workstations and large high-performance visualization systems had been made, a trend that SGI would continue for the rest of their life. We return to our story in the year 1991. SGI is a reasonably successful Unix workstation manufacturer, which currently produces the Personal Iris and Power Series product lines. These product lines have grown SGI's revenue from $86 million in 1987 to $420 million in 1990, but 1991 is about to see SGI introduce one of its most recognizable machines of all time. As CEO Ed McCracken said at the time, the PC and workstation worlds are converging. On June 22, 1991, Silicon Graphics announced their Iris Indigo workstation. The exterior of the Indigo was completely new, and many consider it to be the best-looking SGI. More interestingly, however, the IP12 hardware inside was very closely related to the earlier 4D35. The only major difference was the absence of a VME bus. While at first glance this seems like a lazy attempt to make an existing system look new, this was in fact the Indigo's largest breakthrough, allowing the system to be sold for just $8,000. Only a few years earlier, a professional iris cost almost ten times that much. For the first time, SGI had a computer under $10,000. SGI now had the Indigo as a replacement for the personal iris, but for high-end visualization systems, SGI's users still had to buy Power Series machines. This all changed in 1992 with the introduction of the last SGI to use the iris brand, the Iris Crimson. While it lost the multiprocessor capabilities of the Power Series, it gained the new R4000 processor. The R4000 was not only the first 64-bit MIPS processor, but the first 64-bit microprocessor ever, making the Crimson not only the first 64-bit SGI machine, but one of the first computer ever to use a 64-bit microprocessor. While the Crimson is quite a rare system, and names like Indy and Onyx may be better known, it may be SGI's most seen system due simply to one scene in Jurassic Park. It's a unit system. I know this. It's all the files of the whole park. It tells you everything.
The Crimson's MIPS R4000 processor is a story of its own. Just like the R2000 and R3000, it was developed by MIPS Computer Systems. While MIPS processors are most commonly associated with SGI hardware, MIPS actually tried to make their own workstation known as the MIPS Magnum. This, combined with the development of the R4000, was extremely expensive, and despite developing some of the most advanced processors of their time, MIPS was struggling to survive. If MIPS went bankrupt, SGI would lose the processors that powered their systems, and the only ones capable of running IRIX. SGI knew this, and in 1992 they agreed to acquire MIPS computer systems for $333 million so as to secure the supply of future processors. 1993 begins with the release of the Indigo 2 in January, a continuation of the popular Indigo. At launch, the product was only available with an R4400 CPU and SGI Extreme graphics. This was a somewhat high-end configuration of the Indigo 2, and it actually wasn't until later that cost-reduced versions were introduced. That same month, the SGI Onyx was released. The Onyx merged the Crimson's R4000 processor with the multiprocessor support of the Power Series systems, and added the new Reality Engine 2 and VTX graphics systems. It supported up to 2GB of RAM in desk size, while rack side systems max out at 16GB. Sorry MacBook Pro, you're 23 years late. At this point, SGI has two product categories, just as they have since the Personal Iris and Power Series launched, but a third category of SGI machine is about to enter the market. In early 1993, if you wanted a cheaper SGI than the Indigo 2, you bought the fast-aging Indigo R4000, but this is about to change. In July 1993, SGI released their new Indie workstation. Like the Indigo before it, performance was not the Indie's strong point. With a 100MHz R4000 PC processor, unaccelerated frame buffer graphics that could only show 200 256 colors, 16 megabytes of RAM, and no hard drive at all, the now famous phrase, Indigo without the Go, was internally coined by SGI product marketing manager Mark Hughes, and eventually leaked online. The Indie's strong point was its price, at $4,995. For the price of an Indigo 2, you could have six Indies. <laughs> We return to our story on the day the first SGI Indie was delivered to a customer in 1993. As the low-end machine, nobody expected it to perform as well as the Indigo 2 or Onyx, but most people expected it to at least run its own operating system acceptably. Unfortunately, it didn't. To keep the price low, SGI decided last minute to ship the Indie with 16 megabytes of RAM in base models, making the much more reasonable 32 megabytes optional. Programmers had been told they were developing for a 32 megabyte system, and had no time to adapt their software for 16 megabytes. Because because the hardware was so new, only the latest IRIX version, IRIX 5, was compatible. IRIX 5 was, as detailed in a now infamous leaked internal SGI memo entitled Software Usability 2, poorly written. To quote the memo, Release 5.1 is a disappointment. Performance for common operations has dropped 40% from 4.0.5. We shipped with 500 priority 1 and 2 bugs, and a base indie is much more sluggish than a Macintosh. Try to do some real work on a 16MB indie. Case closed. SGI quickly killed the 16MB Indie, replacing it with an identically priced but far more expensive to produce 32MB version. At the same time, SGI software developers were working hard on fixing bugs and removing bloat. Though it was a rough start, the Indie would go on to be one of SGI's best-selling systems as well as one of their best known. While SGI's rapid-fire product launches up until 1993 may make this hard to believe, SGI's product line remained almost exactly the same until 1996. While these years are considered to be SGI's heyday and certainly saw plenty of sales, from a technology standpoint, the only real changes were the introduction of the MIPS R8000 in 1994, and impact graphics for the Indigo 2 in 1995. While SGI didn't release many of their own products during this time, it's worth noting that SGI did work closely with Nintendo to develop what was then known as Project Reality. Initially planned to come in both arcade and home console variants, it would eventually develop into the Nintendo 64. SGI systems were also used for N64 game development. Returning to the Indigo 2, it had initially done well. It had more RAM than the Indie, so IRIX bloat and memory leaks didn't affect it as much, and the later improved software that made the Indie usable made the Indigo 2 even better. Everything was fine until January 1996, when SGI's new R10,000 Indigo 2 was released. The NEC-made R10,000 CPUs used in the machines had a bug, which would on occasion cause the system to shut down unexpectedly. Despite only 4,000 R10,000 Indigo 2s having been sold, replacing them all with working units cost SGI $10 million. In February 1996, SGI announced their purchase of Cray for a price of $740 million. Cray was a supercomputer company, and at the time, their latest product was the Cray Super Server CS6400. SGI didn't like the product, and opted to sell it and the entire Super Server division to Sun for an undisclosed amount estimated to be around $60 million. 
Sun began development on a successor to the CS6400 under the codename Starfire, and in 1997 the product launched as the Sun Ultra Enterprise 10,000. After the product launched, Sun CEO Scott McNeely was quoted as saying that the CS6400 was the best tech industry investment since Microsoft acquired DOS. Meanwhile, SGI still owned the rest of Cray, and they weren't particularly bothered by the CS6400. The Cray development teams that they had acquired were set to work on developing a new way to interconnect systems, which eventually became CrayLink, later NumaLink. CrayLink allowed multiple systems to be linked together into a single computer running one IRIX installation with up to 512 processors by use of router boards and a large helping of cables. <laughs> After last episode's period of no major product launches, the late 90s were certain to be a time of major advancements for SGI. With improved components for existing systems being their only hardware launches for almost three years straight, it would have to be. Starting at the low end, SGI had begun 1996 with a new R5000-based Indy. While it was quite a good system and did not suffer from any technical issues, it is quite rare today. This is because the R5000 Indy was seemingly a strange stopgap product, meant to bring the R5000 to SGI customers 10 months before their new hardware did. This is a similar story to that of the SGI Crimson, which existed for only a year before being replaced with the Onyx. Unlike the R10,000 systems also introduced in 1996, which seemingly coexisted existed with their successors as cheaper options until 1999, the R5000 Indy was discontinued just months after it was replaced. Its replacement came in the form of the SGI-02, a unified memory architecture workstation released at the end of 1996 for a price of six to fifteen thousand dollars. Interestingly, unlike every other MIPS SGI, its graphics chipset, known as CRM, is built into the motherboard as opposed to on a separate card or board. CRM is quite interesting, so I'll explain a little about it. Like on some models of Indy, geometry calculations are performed on the CPU, meaning that upgrading the O2 CPU can improve graphics performance more than it might on other systems. Though basic geometry is done by the CPU, Z-buffering and texturing are done by a separate chip known as the memory and rendering engine. The O2 also includes compression hardware known as the imaging and compression engine, based on a separate R4000 based CPU and a custom vector processor. With video options available at launch, compression in hardware, and the ability to use up to a MIPS R10000, the O2 was aimed squarely at the professional video, motion graphics, and medical imaging markets. Of course, being an SGI product, it was also great for 3D graphics work if you didn't need all the power of an Indigo 2 impact and wanted something a little cheaper. The O2 was a recipe for success, and successful it was. If you want to see a whole video about my O2, click the link here or the one at the end of the video. The Indy wasn't the only product being replaced in 1996, however. SGI's Challenge and Onyx lines also got an upgrade in the form of the Origin and Onyx 2 lines. Like the Challenge and Onyx before it, the Origin 2000 was available in desk side and rack form factors, though multiple chassis could be linked together to create one larger system. In effect, and with some limitations, if you wanted your giant computer to be twice as powerful, you could just hook it up to another one. This interconnect, known as CrayLink, or later NumaLink, was the result of SGI's acquisition of Cray, and is actually still used in some form in the SGI systems of today. If you wanted graphics capability, you could get the same system with one or more additional Infinite Reality 2 graphics systems. This variant was known as the Onyx 2. Regardless of brand name, internally the systems all used a new architecture which SGI called S2MP. SGI wasn't done replacing Challenges, though, because the Indigo 2-based Challenge M also needed an upgrade. This came in the form of the Origin 200, an S2MP-based server with a simple Craylink implementation and a MIPS R10000 processor. While I can't say for sure, the Origin 200 seems to be one of the less talked about SGI systems today. This is backed up by some Nekochan forum search results. While the system performed well, and was, from what I can tell, well-reviewed, its very SGI-like $30-$60,000 price, and the ever-growing threat of Linux may have hurt widespread use of the systems for basic server tasks. Though the Challenge Onyx and Indy had all been replaced by late 1996, SGI's highest-end workstation system was still the Indigo 2 Impact 10,000. Its replacement came in the form of the SGI Octane, released in early 1997. From a graphics standpoint, the system used a somewhat improved version of the Indigo 2's Impact chipset. The Octane also used the same R10,000 processor that other SGI's had had for almost a year by that point. In fact, at first glance, you may wonder why the Octane was one of SGI's most successful systems of all time. The answer lies with the Octane's system architecture. 
While not identical to the Origins S2MP, it is closely related and shares many technologies such as XIO and the crossbar interconnect. This not only allows for incredibly high bandwidth communications within the system, but also allows the system's architecture to support multiple processors. SGI took full advantage, shipping the Octane with optional dual CPUs instead of just one chip like every other desktop all the way back to the personal iris. These two capabilities turned the Octane from an Indigo 2 Impact 10,000 in a faded Indigo case into a seriously capable graphics and video workstation, which some insist today was SGI's last truly great product. Perhaps the most memorable thing about the Octane, however, is how they marketed it. SGI was known for their strange merchandise, such as the inflatable O2, Espresso Go Coffee Maker, and Wind Up Walking Origin 200, but I suspect most would say the Octane beats them all. Best known as the Octane Soundtrack, a five-song album SGI released to promote the Octane. I have a dream, and it's called a crossbar switch. What this will mean? Data in and out of here Just with the flip of a switch I have a dream and it's called A crossbar switch Octane, we're gonna rock Octane This thing called Octane It swings with performance It's a bit strange. Less known, however, are Octane Ale and Beer, Octane Keychains, the Roctane CD player, and even an unconfirmed account of Octane lighters, which were supposedly destroyed after challenge power supplies were revealed to have electrical safety issues. If you want to see a video about my main Octane, which is also currently my main SGI and the one I gave OS First Timer access to, click here, or as said earlier, wait for all of the links to appear at the end of the video. <laughs> We return in the year 1997. SGI has just announced their new Octane workstation, which seems to be a success. Their O2, Origin series, and Onyx 2, released a year earlier, are also doing well. With their entire product line refreshed reasonably close to the same time, there wouldn't be much to say about their MIPS products for a few years. That, however, doesn't mean there's nothing to talk about. For a seemingly unknown amount of time leading up to the end of 1997, SGI CEO Edward R. McCracken had been planning to step down as CEO. In January 1998, Silicon Graphics named Richard Beluzzo as their new CEO and chairman of the board. After working at HP for 23 years, and by the end becoming their executive vice president, this was a major event in the history of both companies. While at HP, Beluzzo advocated a shift away from HP's HPUX and PA Risk platform in favor of Intel's highly publicized upcoming Itanium architecture and Microsoft's Windows NT. Once at SGI, his opinions on technology remained unchanged. Under his leadership, SGI reduced reduced spending on IRIX and MIPS and began to work towards NT on Itanium instead. It should be noted that 1998, the year Beluzzo took charge as CEO, was also the year all IRIX updates began to be branded as 6.5.x as opposed to 6.6 or 7.0, seemingly signaling a loss of interest, at least from the marketing department. The same can be said for the MIPS architecture, which had major development initiatives for future chips cancelled in favor of making improvements to the existing R10,000. All that said, SGI was still doing well, and this shift of focus didn't make their MIPS products any less capable. In fact, since they had just refreshed their systems and nobody was expecting upgrades for at least a few years, Beluzzo's effects on the company would not be immediately visible. SGI's next big news would come on January 11th, 1999. This news was the release of the Silicon Graphics Visual Workstation 320 and 540. Though Itanium was not yet available, it was SGI's first system to run Windows NT. Because Itanium wasn't out yet, SGI shipped the 540 with four Intel Pentium 2 Xeon processors and the 320 with two. These systems were aimed at the low-end workstation market, with both systems falling below both the Octane and O2 in terms of price. Just a few months after that, on April 13th, 1999, SGI announced that they were changing their corporate identity from Silicon Graphics to simply SGI. While their name was still officially Silicon Graphics Incorporated, all products and marketing material were switched. With the new name came a new logo and font, as well as a redesign of the SGI.com website. The reasoning, as given by Richard Beluzzo, is as follows. 
Although the marketplace sees us primarily as a leading provider of 3D graphics workstations, our core offerings also include servers, supercomputers, and global services. This change to SGI provides us with a broader identity that more appropriately communicates the full breadth of products and services we offer. Though the Visual Workstation had fulfilled the workstation side of what SGI called their dual-platform strategy, SGI still did not have an x86-based server to accompany it. That changed on August 2nd, 1999, with the introduction of the SGI 1000 server family. Family. This included the SGI 1200 and SGI 1400L, which were available in rack mount or desk side form factors. Interestingly, rather than Windows NT, the 1000 family ran Red Hat Linux. Though SGI practically never released sales figures for their products, it appears that the 1000 series was significantly less successful than the Visual Workstation, which is itself seemingly only moderately so. We now return to Cray, a company SGI had acquired only three years prior. The Craylink-based Origin and Onyx 2 lines were very capable systems, and work on a new architecture codenamed SN1 was underway. SGI, however, seemed to have gotten everything it wanted out of Cray, because in August of 1999, SGI unexpectedly set up a separate business unit for Cray Research, in preparation to separate Cray from SGI. Then, on August 23rd, 1999, something unexpected happened. After just a year and a half at SGI, Richard Beluzzo left. Replacing him as CEO and chairman of the board was Robert Bishop, who had been an SGI employee since 1986 and is credited with building their international division. While it seems strange that Beluzzo would leave SGI less than two years after leaving HP, where he had worked for many decades, he would go on to become president and COO of Microsoft, which he also left after a year. Returning to Cray, as expected, on March 2nd, 2000, Cray Research was sold to the Terra Computer Company. Terra then renamed themselves to Cray Incorporated and continues to operate under the name today. Moving forward a few months to June 2000, we now turn our attention to another company, the Intergraph Corporation. Intergraph was planning to move to the software industry after 31 years as a hardware company. They sold their workstation and server divisions to SGI. The addition of Intergraph's ZX10 servers and workstations to SGI's product line added a second, completely different x86-based product alongside the SGI 1000 series and Visual Workstation product lines. <laughs> Returning to our story in mid-2000, SGI's MIPS product lines are largely identical to those of 1997. Though some systems had gotten faster R10,000s or the new R12,000, a somewhat improved version of effectively the same processor, no new MIPS products had been introduced. While the early 2000s would see many MIPS products replaced, SGI chose to start, oddly, with the only one-year-old Visual Workstation. As discussed last episode, the Visual Workstation product line consisted of the Visual Workstation 320 and the Visual Workstation 540. While both of these products ran Microsoft Windows on an Intel x86 processor, they were architecturally far closer to SGI's MIPS-based O2, and had many O2-like elements such as high-performance graphics built into the motherboard, analog video I.O., and ARC's boot firmware. This changed on May 15, 2000 with the release of the Visual Workstation 230, 330, and 550. Though these systems were the first Visual Workstations to come with Linux as a factory option, as the SGI 1000 series servers did, they lost the abnormal features in favor of standard PC hardware such as an Acer M23D motherboard and NVIDIA GeForce and Quadro graphics cards, which SGI rebranded as the VPro V3, VR3, V7, and VR7. The next big announcement from SGI was the Octane 2, released in June 2000. Unlike the Indigo 2, however, the Octane 2 was in effect an upgraded but similar version of its predecessor. Though the Octane 2 was marketed as featuring faster processors, an upgraded front plane system board and power supply, and VPro V6 and V8 graphics boards, all of these upgrades could and in many cases already had been performed on the original Octane. Still, the Octane 2 was a capable machine, and while it is seemingly not as common as the original Octane, it appears to have been a commercial success. The next product refresh came just a few months later in July 2000, this time for the Origin 2000 and Onyx 2. These replacements were the Origin 3000 and its graphics-capable version the Onyx 3000. Both were MIPS-powered supercomputers composed of rack-mount bricks connected via NumaLink. This modular architecture, codenamed SN1 and later SN MIPS, allowed for even more modularity and expandability than the Origin 2000's S2MP. Bricks could contain disks, infinite reality graphics pipes, CPUs, XIO or PCI expansion slots, and other system components across one or more racks. While its first use was in large supercomputers, SN1 was far more versatile than simply rack-sized supercomputing systems, as SGI customers would soon discover. 
Returning to non-MIPS products, SGI was about to release yet another Intel-based product line. Though SGI already had the Visual Workstation, Intergraph ZX10, and SGI 1000 series x86 products, as well as their MIPS offerings, on May 29th, 2001, SGI released the Silicon Graphics 750, their first Itanium product. The 750 was manufactured by Intel as a reference Itanium design, and was also sold as the Dell Precision Workstation 730, IBM IntelliStation Z Type 6894, HP i2000, and Fujitsu Siemens Celsius 800. Though a 2003 Register article claims that 55 systems were sold in total, this is called into question by a 2001 Ohio Supercomputer Center press release detailing a 146 processor cluster, meaning that at least 73 systems were used. It can, however, be concluded that the system was a failure, as SGI quietly pulled it from the market only six months into its lifespan, and very few are still known to exist today. It's worth noting that in August of 2001, SGI reintroduced the O2 as the O2+. Plus. Though the color was changed and lower-end CPU configurations were eliminated in favor of the faster R7000, the O2 Plus is essentially the same computer as the original O2. With the Octane 2, O2 Plus, Onyx 3000, and Origin 3000 all released, the only SGI product still in need of an upgrade was the Origin 200. That changed in October of 2001 with the release of the Origin 300. The Origin 300 was effectively an Origin 3000 system condensed into a 2U server. This meant that while an Origin 3000 C brick was useless without at least an I or IX brick, an Origin 300 could operate on its own as a fully functional server, with Numalink only being needed for expansion. Positioned as a lower-end system, the Origin 300 was less expandable than the Origin 3000, supporting up to 32 CPUs if 8 units were Numalink, as opposed to the Origin 3000's 1024 CPU maximum. Return to our story in late 2001. Though SGI has spent the last few years filling in both sides of its dual-platform strategy, there's little doubt that the eventual plan is to transition fully to Itanium, even in spite of the SGI 750's catastrophic yet almost silent failure. That, however, didn't mean that there was no more demand for MIPS products. In fact, two new MIPS products were in the works. The first was codenamed Banana 2000, illustrated here by an actual banana. Intended as a successor to the O2, the Banana 2000 was the brainchild of SGI employee Casey Leadham and featured a dual-core Broadcom MIPS processor, a first for SGI who had previously relied on multiple individual processors for multi-threading. Unlike previous SGI systems, Banana 2000 used NVIDIA graphics connected via either PCI Express or a proprietary NVIDIA bus. Due to PCI Express first being introduced to the public in 2003, this makes the proprietary bus a far more likely option. Unfortunately, the Banana 2000 project was killed by management in favor of Itanium at a different MIPS project. The other project, codenamed Asterix, was a far less ambitious desktop version of SGI's SN1 server architecture. Designed to use a single CPU and built in a standard Palo Alto Designs PA810 case, the same as was used on the SGI 230, Asterix was far from SGI's most powerful product, in some cases even being outperformed by the Octane 2. On January 29, 2002, Asterix was released as the SGI Fuel. Intended to fit between the Octane 2 and O2+, the Fuel is frequently said to have been planned to be SGI's last MIPS workstation before a full transition to Itanium would take place. While this directly contradicts the February 12th press release in which SGI states that the new faster R14000A demonstrates our long-term commitment to MIPS technology-based product lines, it is quite likely SGI was only trying to avoid jeopardizing their new products. Though SGI had failed at Itanium with the SGI 750, the plan was still to transition fully to it. With a complete lack of any Itanium products following the cancellation of the 750, SGI was ready to introduce their first true Itanium replacement for a MIPS product, starting with the Origin 3000. On January 7th, 2003, SGI introduced the Altix 3000 and Altix 350 line of Linux-powered Itanium servers and supercomputers. Like the Origin line, the 350 was made up of small 2U servers starting at $70,176, while the 3000 consisted of a large rack with up to 64 processors, spread out across bricks like in the Origin 3000. In its maximum 64 processor configuration, the Altix 3000 cost over $1.1 million. Though the Ultix 350 was the beginning of SGI's Itanium servers, and the fuel was seemingly intended to be the last MIPS workstation, SGI's MIPS servers were apparently still in need of an upgrade. On April 15, 2003, SGI announced the Origin 350, codenamed Chimera. 
Like the Origin 300 before it, it could function alone or with multiple units, and while it retained the same form factor, made numerous minor upgrades to the system. Origin 350s equipped with V-Pro V12 graphics boards were sold as the Onyx 350. Oddly, just three months later, on July 14, 2003, SGI announced another Chimera-based system known as the Onyx 4. Its main difference from the Onyx 350 was its use of ATI Fire GL graphics cards instead of SGI's own V-Pro or Infinite Reality. With the Onyx 4, Fuel, and Origin 350 announced, SGI's MIPS product line appeared to be over. However, later that day, after the announcement of the Onyx 4, SGI announced the SGI Tezro, the true final MIPS workstation. The Tezro, it seemed, was the result of a last-minute change of mind on SGI's part. Like the Fuel, the Tezro was based on the Origin 3000 architecture and used the same MIPS R14000 and R16000 processors, as well as the same RAM. While the Tezro was not wildly successful, it did perform exceptionally for video editing, which is seemingly worth where most of them were used. The Tezro also marked the return of SGI's original Cube logo to their systems, and displays it prominently with backlighting on the front panel. Due to being the last MIPS system ever produced by SGI, as well as being somewhat uncommon, the Tezro is still extremely valuable among businesses and hobbyists alike, with working units regularly selling for over $1,000 on both eBay and Nekochan. With Itanium set as the clear goal for SGI, an Itanium counterpart to the Tezro was clearly needed. In April of 2005, SGI announced the SGI Prism desk side, an Itanium workstation using one or two Itanium processors running Linux in an aesthetically redesigned version of the Tezro case. The Prism was also available in larger half-rack and full-rack sizes, marketed for multi-user visualization work. Though it used Itanium processors and ran Linux like the Altix, the Prism included quick transit emulation software, enabling IRIX binaries to be run on Itanium. Like the Onyx 4, the Prism used ATI FireGL graphics cards. In July of 2005, SGI also announced the Altix 330, an entry-level 1U Linux server selling for just $7,000, making it the cheapest product ever to support Numalink. Not much is known about the Altix 330, as it was seemingly not particularly successful, likely due to other low-end Linux servers being available for less, albeit without Numalink. Its appearance is one of the most boring, least flashy designs ever produced by SGI, with an appearance more reminiscent of a Dell PowerEdge or Enterprise Ethernet switch than of SGI's past bright-colored products. Though SGI had many interesting new products, they were still struggling financially. Despite hiring advisors to help them return to profitability and receiving a new line of credit in mid-2005, SGI was still seriously at risk of running out of money entirely. In fact, by late 2005, SGI's market capitalization had fallen to just $120 million, only 109 times the sale price of their flagship Altix 3000. This was especially dire when compared to SGI's $7 billion figure of only 10 years before. On November 1st of 2005, Silicon Graphics Incorporated received notification from the New York Stock Exchange that their common stock, ticker symbol SGI, had been delisted due to failing to average a closing share price of $1 for 30 consecutive days. Despite their severe financial difficulties, SGI continued to release new products. In fact, just 14 days after they were delisted from the NYSE, on November 14th, 2005, SGI announced their Altix 4000 line, starting with the Altix 4700. Rather than the Altix 3000's brick-based design, the Altix 4700 consisted of numerous blades containing either CPUs and RAM, FPGAs, or RAM alone, which were inserted into rack mount enclosures called individual rack units, or IRUs. SGI also promised support for upcoming dual-core Itanium chips, and while the system was advertised as supporting up to 512 CPUs, SGI reportedly shipped some units with up to 2,048, with a theoretical maximum of 8,192. The system also supported up to 192 terabytes of memory, if memory blades were used. With SGI's financial problems still looming, in January of 2006, SGI hired Dennis McKenna as their new CEO and chairman of the board as part of a broader restructuring effort. Then, on May 8, 2006, SGI announced that it had filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy protection, which allowed them to continue operations and restructure in hopes of being able to repair financial problems. The motion was approved by the U.S. Bankruptcy Court two days later on May 10. SGI also got a new stock symbol, SGID.PK. However, once again, despite their financial difficulties, SGI was about to release a product. On June 26, 2006, SGI introduced the Altex 450, featuring dual-core Itanium CPUs and supposedly performing up to 2.5 times as well as the Altex 350. Like the Altex 4700, the 450 consisted of IRUs, up to four of which could be Numalinked together, creating a 38-CPU, 76-core system. The same day, SGI further expanded the Altex product line with the new Altex XE, an Intel Xeon x86-based line of Altex products. Though Nekochan Wiki lists 11 separate but seemingly closely related models, not much is known 
known about Altex XC systems, and it appears that few, if any at all, are currently owned by hobbyists. From the few pictures available, it appears that the Altex XE was a standard rack mount server, not a NumaLink enabled or IRU based system like the Altex 4700, but was in some cases sold for cluster use. Then, on September 6, 2006, the nine year long slow death of SGI's MIPS products finally came to a close with the announcement of the end of development of the MIPS product line and the IRIX operating system. After production was to end on the 29th of December, the last orders would be shipped in March. According to some, however, this was not entirely true. On a sunhelp.org mailing list post from 2015, a user named Jonathan Sturges said the following, They were also still manufacturing new fuel workstations at least as recently as 2010. I was at the factory and saw them myself. I was pretty surprised to see a MIPS machine still in production. While the truthfulness of this claim is somewhat debated, it is possible, seeing as the SGI fuel is still a supported product up until March 31st, 2018. On October 17, 2006, SGI emerged from bankruptcy protection, cancelling its SGID.PK stock and issuing a new one with the symbol SGIC. SGI also moved their headquarters from Mountain View to Sunnyvale, selling its Amphitheater Parkway headquarters to Google, who named it the Googleplex. As an interesting note, their earlier North Shoreline headquarters is now occupied by the Computer History Museum. Though SGI's CEO Dennis McKenna had only held his position for a little over a year, on April 9, 2007, SGI announced that they had selected a new CEO, Robert Bo Ewald. Ewald. Ewald had worked for SGI in the past and was returning to the company after the limited success of his own company, Linux Networks, many assets of which would shortly be acquired by SGI. With immediate disaster avoided, exactly a year after the launch of the Altix 450 and Altix XE, on June 26, 2007, SGI announced yet another new Altix product, the Altix ICE 8200. Powered by x86-based Intel Xeon processors like the Altix XE and composed of IRUs like the Altix 4700, the Altix ICE emphasized simple deployment as a major selling point, an interesting decision given the often long construction times of high-performance computing systems. Though SGI had been focused entirely on its Altix high-performance computing products since 2005's Prism, on April 9, 2007, SGI was preparing to re-enter the visualization market with the SGI Virtue VN200, a rack mount blade server similar in appearance to a single Altix IRU and consistent of multiple standard Intel PCs with optional GPUs. Like essentially all SGI systems from the time, the VN200 is exceedingly rare and likely completely non-existent among hobbyists, as sales were poor and any units sold are likely still in service. Unfortunately, though they had avoided their first bankruptcy, SGI's financial situation was still extremely strained. As a result, SGI could not afford to develop their own workstation version of the Virtue, and instead opted to rebrand Box Technologies 3D Box Series PC as an SGI product. In fact, the only difference between the devices was that the square cooling mesh on the front of the unit was purple on the SGI version, and all box branding, including the disproportionately large box logo plate, had been completely replaced with SGI. Apart from that, the Virtue VS series was a completely normal PC, featuring a Xeon or Opteron processor and Windows Vista or Linux. One MakoChan user is known to own a Virtue VS workstation, obtained from the same eBay listing as the incredibly hard to find pictures used here came from. SGI, however, was clearly on the way out. As of December of 2008, SGI's market value was consistently below $35 million, with an annual net income of less than $500,000. As such, they received a delisting notification from NASDAQ, and on April 1, 2009, SGI announced that they'd filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy once again, and that they planned to sell essentially all of their assets to Rackable Systems, a PC server manufacturer, for $25 million. The sale, ultimately finalized for $42.5 million, on May 11, 2009, formally ended Silicon Graphics Incorporated's 27 year life. Rackable Systems, subsequently rebranded to Silicon Graphics International in order to maintain the SGI acronym, would go on to produce numerous products under numerous SGI brands, such as the Octane 3 desktop x86 cluster and Origin 400 x86 server, as well as numerous more closely related Altix follow-ups, also using x86 processors, before they themselves were purchased by Hewlett Packard Enterprise, or HPE, on August 11th, 2016. So that was it both part seven and the entire history of SGI series. So uh, if you did enjoy the video and the series, then please do subscribe as it does help us grow. We're still a very, very small channel. And until next time, thanks for watching, bye.